uh, thanks, John. Thanks for joining us, John and John, and uh, and any other Johns out there. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Um, so yes, uh, so John, uh, John uh, Smolensky, uh, John S. In well, we can't even do John S. Here, can we? Uh, Mr. Smalls uh, sent, uh, sent me a message a couple of weeks ago and said he wanted to have a conversation about this. Uh, a lot of my background recently has been in uh, tequila, uh, which has a lot of crossovers with this conversation. Uh, awful lot of crossovers. So definitely a conversation that I've enjoyed having uh, over the years, and and one that really kind of stimulates a, a, a really good discussion. Uh, so really excited to do this. I've got a little bit of background in working with contract whiskies as well. Um, about a half a decade ago in a different brand ambassador life. Um, so uh, really excited to have this conversation. John's also very generously donated and Sovereign has generously donated $5 for everyone uh, who shows up here to uh, the Bartenders Benevolent Fund. Uh, that is a uh, non-for-profit um, hospitality focused organization which supports bartenders, servers, and front of house support staff um, uh, during this crazy, crazy time. Uh, so we've raised a, a fair amount of money and uh, we're gonna continue to do so uh, every Monday. Uh, check us out on Instagram and on our website, www.bartendersbenevolentfund.ca. Uh, and uh, every Monday we announce every alloc financial allocations per province and every Tuesday at 12 p.m. EST, so Eastern time, 9 a.m. for everyone out West. Um, you, we open up the funds. So um, every week we do it. If you don't get in, then next week. A knock, who knocks on the door these days? <laughs> so with that, thank you very much. And I'll, uh, I guess I'll pass this over. It's like a jungle in here. <laughs> Ah, uh, was it our turn now? Okay, good. Uh, God, that's funny. I can't tell you how many uh, calls John and I have been on in, in the last six weeks that have gotten um, interrupted by wildlife of some sort. <laughs> I, I just, I just had to mute myself because the FedEx guy just pulled up and my dog went crazy. <laughs> so, <I'm over> here. <laughs> so yeah, we're we're with you. I saw you wave at somebody. What y'all don't realize is John is basically in front of a big window in his house. So he can see everybody coming and going and stopping by. Uh, John, are we ready? John S? We are ready, yeah, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was this listen, week's bomb, I think. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and spending some time with us. Um, Hopefully it'll be fun and entertaining and informative and all the things that uh, that we all want it to be. I'm I'm Johnny Foster. I'm the sales guy at Smooth Ambler. Uh, my other John is John Little with the barrels behind him. Um, our head distiller. Uh, we've been around from day one, and really this is just to talk about uh, a little bit about the brand, a little bit about what we do. Specific though to sourcing, to sort of pull back uh, and and look behind the curtain of uh, of sourced whiskeys. A lot of people do it. Very few people talk about it. You know, half the time you got to, uh, you know, there's either pretense about it, where stuff came from, or there's just no information whatsoever. And, you know, the fewer questions you ask, the happier the reps are. Uh, and so we're just going to talk about how our approach to that and tell you what, say everything we can tell you about what we know uh, about procuring whiskey and what we think is the the right way to do it. And I've got a little deck that I thought we'd go through fairly quickly because I, I don't want to get bogged down on the deck. What I want to do is have some conversations and and, uh, and answer some questions. So if with your indulgence, we'll do that. We'll go through the deck, bring up a couple of things, and then uh, we'll have hopefully a pretty spirited, no pun intended, Q&A at the end. Uh, Johnny Little, you want to chime in and say anything? Nope. Let's let's get going, and then we'll uh, we'll adjust. You know, we'll, we'll uh, speak to each specific point when it comes up, and then answer questions. Great. Okay, 
So just, just getting into some basic timeline stuff uh, with us. Uh, 2008, uh, John and his father-in-law sort of had the idea, you know, when, when the, the crash of 2008 happened, it made a lot of people start to evaluate uh, maybe what they wanted to do. And they began to think about getting into um, a different business. And after a lot of uh, investigation and research, uh, they determined that here in the mountains of West Virginia, great place to make whiskey. Nobody had ever really done it before. There's a lot of, there's a lot of moonshine made here. There's never really any um, proper cocktail whiskey. And so once that sort of took shape, uh, John and I have been buddies, by the way, for 19 years, I guess. But we've been friends for a long time predating the business. And, uh, and I was the, really the, the next person that they brought on, on board. But the idea for it goes back to 2008, and it was really just make great whiskey in West Virginia. 2009, we, we started the, to build the distillery, began distilling uh, in 2010. Like a lot of craft people, small producers, even to this day, we started with vodka and gin and, and bourbon, always knowing we were really going to be a whiskey company. But vodka and gin take 10 days or two weeks. And, uh, and so we started out. We do not make either of those anymore. We, we only make... And in, for the purposes, mostly of today's discussion, source, uh, bourbon and, and rye. Uh, and then, so, so we opened the doors in 2010, started sourcing in 2011. I bring that up really because we did it, we did it backwards. Most people start with sourced product until they can get, you know, uh, generate some profits and get the doors open and then figure out uh, what mash bills um, they want to make and then they start making we did the opposite we we distilled a weeded bourbons the first whiskey we ever made from the day we opened the doors and discovered uh sourcing and full later and folded that into our business back then and we'll talk about a little this a little bit later back then it was two avenues of thought you either only made uh everything homemade or you only sourced and so we were one of the first people to sort of do both of those uh proudly 2016, with one of those source whiskeys, we won best single barrel bourbon in the world, according to um, Whiskey Magazine. Um, again, we immediately gave uh, the distiller of that whiskey, MGP, uh, uh, credit, I guess, for, for doing the heavy lifting. And in 2018, we won the best craft uh, whiskey distiller in America and USA Today's Reader's Choice Awards. That one felt really good to me because it's nice to win these uh, whiskey competitions and whiskey magazine awards. But you know, my dad, I'm the baby of my family. My dad's in his eighties. Dad's not reading Whiskey Advocate or Whiskey Magazine, but he sure shit knows what USA Today is. And that kind of felt good to, to win something sort of uh, main, mainstream. Real quickly, you know all this. I only bring it up because we, you, 10 years into it, we still get asked all the time that you can't make bourbon in West Virginia. Of course you can. Make it anywhere in the U.S., 51% corn or more, distilled at no more than 160, barreled at no more than 125, uh, all of this kind of stuff. And we, of course, comply with all of these kinds of things. John and Johnny, I have always said. Johnny, I think everybody's still seeing your main slide page. What? I think everybody's still seeing your main slide the main page. Main slide page? Yeah. Share the screen. <laughs> there well, you go. That looks great. Okay. Sorry, I don't know. Thank you for catching me. Um, anyway, as I was talking about the, 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 the way we approach bourbon, we decided early on we weren't going to reinvent the wheel. The way we said that is we weren't trying to color outside the line. We were just trying to move the line a little bit, and that really applies to the sourced stuff as well as, uh, as the homemade. Source whiskey or, or merchant bottling, uh, as I said, we got into that in our second year uh, after we had distilled for a while. Um, and, you know, really what we source is anything called Old Scout. Scout, like we scouted it out. Uh, we like to refer to it sometimes as whiskey antiquing. Uh, so the Old Scout American whiskey, the bourbon, the custom pick bourbon, and then there are a few other iterations of Old Scout that really are only available at the gift shop in West Virginia at this point. But the main thing we want you to know and everyone to know is if it says Old Scout on it, uh, it means that it is not 100% distilled by us. 
uh, it is made somewhere else. So let me let me let me speak to that just a little bit. When we first yeah. started when we first started sourcing whiskey, uh, you know, we we fell into that business. Uh, John Smolinski and John Gray, when we talked about that just a little bit earlier, you know, we we fell into that. So in 2011, we went to Vendome, which is you know the most people know who Vendome is, but they make the you know most of the uh, American whiskey stills. And and they supply a lot of a lot of the still uh, stills for the craft whiskey world or the craft world in general, craft distilling world. Uh, and we went to there to, to buy another still. Uh, found out that there was there were people who were actually buying um, or buying whiskey that they didn't make. Didn't even really know that was really a thing at the time. Maybe it was the end of 2010 that happened. And then by the by the uh, beginning of 2011. We had had a conversation with a guy named Richard Wolf, a really wonderful guy who brokers whiskey, sells whiskey for, uh, you know, for MGP and then a variety of other distilleries. And at first, when we when we started sourcing, we went through about 10, uh, 10 products from a variety of manufacturers when we first started and um, liked many of them, right? That was a very different time when there was a lot of uh, what we call spot purchase, which John's, John's going to get to. Um, and just on the next slide, but there was a lot of whiskey that was spot purchased that was available. Um, and so we taste a lot of things. The MGP recipe that we started off with, the first Old Scout we started off with, was the 11th thing we tasted and or sampled. And we knew it was what we wanted um, the moment that we smelled it. I just fell in love with the product. <clears throat> but, at, but at the time, you know, we, we thought of Old Scout as a very different thing. We, saw, we thought of sourcing whiskey, as like John just said, as antique shopping for whiskey. So the closest thing that, that we came up to originally was uh, independent bottled product from Scotland, people who were buying other people's products and either aging them in some unique way or uh, aging them longer or uh, finishing them. I guess that would still be in, in, under an unusual maturation or unusual aging, but you're finishing them in, in some way and, and calling them their own and creating value for both the independent bottler and for the manufacturer. And that's originally where we wanted to go and still I think would be really wonderful, but it doesn't seem like anybody inside of the American whiskey business wants to follow that model. But that's what we started with. We started with antique shopping for whiskey. We've always thought of Old Scout like that and going out and trying to find really cool barrels uh, and really interesting things that the product took on a life of its own. And we, we kind of diverted our business in that direction. Old Scout became bigger than we ever dreamed of. So that was it's a little bit of an interest about how we how we got into the business and then how the business has really changed even over this short eight or nine year well it really happened over about five year period but we're still in that really very much changed world where it's not exactly what we started out doing go ahead johnny Sorry. yeah yeah you know the the and we're i think we'll get into a little bit of this metaphor later when we talk about the next slides uh, spot purchasing and under contract purchasing but you know I think of it as ingredients in a chef's kitchen. You know, like you go have a great steak. Um, the chef didn't make, you know, the chef didn't grow the steer. The chef took a, a fantastic ingredient and put, put their spin on it and made it available to you. And a lot of times I think that that's what we try and do with the whiskey is, is, you know, we are proud of, of whatever little, that we can magic, we can concoct, and we can add to it in West Virginia, while also giving credit to uh, to the people who distilled it. Same same way, I think a restaurant would be proud of their menu, tell you how hard they work to to source the finest ingredients, but at the same time, that their kitchen does play a little bit of a role uh, in in what winds up on your plate, right? So, let's talk a little bit about those two streams, uh, spot purchases, as you heard John say earlier, and whiskey made under contract. Um, John, you? So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this. this. Yes. So the first, first time we ever bought whiskey, we bought whiskey, um, we bought the first order was 40 barrels, and then we bought 80 barrels, and then we bought 120 barrels. And then luckily we, we have a, a really great investor and he had seen enough of that. And he said, let's go out and get as many barrels as we, as we can. And all of those barrels were, were what we call spot purchases. So spot purchases for us are, is whiskey that is already matured. And that is either owned by the distiller, the manufacturer, or owned by a brand or some other speculative buyer. 
in the marketplace. And so they, um, you know, that, that, that world has really gone kind of crazy. The speculative purchase market has gone crazy since 2000, probably 2012, I would say, end of 11, beginning of 12 has gone pretty crazy where lots of people are investing in whiskey that don't really have distilleries or even brands because they, they saw that how fast the prices were changing in that market. So the first products that we actually ever bought were barrels that were owned by Foster's. They were owned by a brand that had, uh, that had RTDs in Australia. People were, I guess the government thought people were drinking too many RTDs, raised the taxes on the RTDs. <clears throat> that caused the market to, to drop and that caused a surplus of whiskey. And that whiskey was now, uh, old and really delicious and probably more valuable and maybe maybe even off profile i'm that's not something i would know but maybe off profile for them and they thought it was better off to to be sold and so we bought whiskey from them for the first the first uh maybe first couple thousand barrels that we bought were all owned by them and we've continued to do that over the years we continue to buy from from people who had whiskey along the way and we still do a little bit of that maybe to fill gaps or if we find that there's something really interesting the American whiskey that we're tasting actually came from a distillery in Tennessee. Um, and so we, we continually look for spot purchase that we think is delicious and affordable. The, the market has gone crazy. We have never been ones to, um, we probably have, it's probably caused us not to grow as fast, but we've never been ones to go out there and buy really expensive whiskey just to keep the brand alive. That's really not what we wanted to do. Be very, um, be very careful about what we did and to be very smart about our purchases and and so we never really went and paid these crazy amounts of dollars for barrels unless it was absolutely necessary for some reason or another so that's kind of our what, what we've done what we did all along uh in 2015 2016 that market went away not just for well, it really started going away in 12 or 13 but by 15 and 16 that market was really gone there were just not enough barrels to, to meet demand, aged inventory to meet demand. And so what, what we had spent four years building up, which was Old Scout, everybody called it Old Scout 7, but it was an Old Scout high rye, uh, the high rye recipe from MGP, Old Scout 10, which was a low rye recipe from MGP and a 95% rye whiskey from MGP. We had built those products up and then we basically ran out of all of it. We kept thinking there were gonna be these deals that never came to fruition for spot purchases. Uh, and so basically we built five years, we took five years building up this, our portfolio and, and getting some really nice sales. And then all of that product went away in about six months. It's a really great way to run a business is just to build it up as big as it can get and then just close the doors uh, on those, on those, <laughs> on those skews. It's, um, it's, it was really wonderful. It was great. It was, it was great. The sales guy <laughs> says it was really great. Uh, so anyway, Back in 2014, we were shut down for a, um, we were shut down for an expansion. We went again, the first deal that we, that second steel we bought in 2011, we bought, we replaced that in the original steel with a column steel in 2015, but we shut down in 2014. And so at the time there was a, this kind of this long story, sorry. So if everybody's getting bored, let me know. So in 14, when we shut down to do all of our reconstruction and to put a column steel in, in place of our two pot steels, we had barrels were basically, uh, basically barrels were non-existent really, unless you had an existing relationship. They had had a cold, a really cold and, and wet season before, which has been unable to get loggers into the wood to pull out trees. And therefore there was a barrel shortage uh, because demand was increasing for barrels and the wood was not there. And luckily we had a barrel contract in place. But at the time we were shut down to put this column still in. So the very first time we bought whiskey under a new mate contract. It was really because we were forced to do that. I wish I'd tell you that we got smart in 2014, but we really didn't. We were kind of forced into this. So uh, we had barrels. We didn't, we couldn't put any whiskey in them because again, this distillery was shut down and we had no still at the time. And so we said, hey, we, we called up MGP and said, hey, we've got these whiskey barrels. Can you put, can you put some whiskey in them for us? Uh, the same recipe that you've been using. And that was the first time that we bought whiskey under new under a new mate contract and then we did that once more in the uh late winter early spring the beginning of 2015 and that's really how we've run our business since then so we have continued to buy new make uh, and in 2016 when we partnered with Pernod, when we, when we sold part of our business to Pernod, 
people asked us if we were going to stop sourcing whiskey and the reality of it is, is that we we're not we we have not we've done both of them so we're making more whiskey than we've ever made and we're sourcing more whiskey than we're ever made but all of that whiskey or most of that whiskey let me say most of that whiskey is whiskey that's purchased under a new make contract and then we have a barrel model right it tells us how many barrels we're going to use four years from now five years from now, up to 10 years from now so we have a barrel model that tells us that this year i've got about 400 of these and 500 of those and 500 of these kind of barrels to supply our lines uh you know four to ten years out into the future but it's all purchased under new make contract or again the most of it's purchased and those are the two different ways that people really buy whiskey like that John, before and of course, we move on you make whiskey. i'm yeah, just gonna sorry. ask a quick question regarding the uh column still uh, why did you purchase the pollen column still? Why did that um, uh, replace uh, the pop stills? What was the uh, motivation behind that? Well, it was volume and uh, and consistency, but mostly it was volume. You can we can move a lot more volume uh, in a in a column still than you can move through a pot still, at least in the space that we have. Um, and and for me, for what we believe after our test results, um, I'm. I think some people do it really, really well, but to make American whiskey, to make a heavy corn uh, content whiskey, I think it's best on a column still. If I was making malt whiskey or rum or something that I would probably still be using a pot still, at least in, in that capacity. But for us, a column still is, we think is, is where it's at for American style whiskey. Okay, so you're able to still purchase pot still whiskey uh, under, under contract? uh for uh, open source but you make your own columns column whiskey as well. no the the whiskey all the whiskey that mgp makes all the whiskey that we've ever sourced has been you know, make, i'm just double checking yeah i'm trying to remember make sure but all the whiskey we've ever purchased has all been column still whiskey we've never purchased pot still whiskey from from anybody we've had some pot still rum that we've secured over over the years but but no whiskey is there a lot more pot pot still uh, uh, oh, sorry call them still whiskey available on the open market? Is it is that uh, pot still whiskey is harder to come by? I, I don't I don't personally know of any pot still whiskey on the market, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It's not something that we actively go after. You know, we 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 have found a couple of sources of whiskey that we really like. Uh, mostly it's coming from MGP in Indiana. The overwhelming percentage of it is coming from MGP in Indiana. And we love that product. And quite frankly, don't see a need, at least as, like I said, as the business has changed a little bit, don't really see a need for, um, to change, right? So we're not actively going out there and pursuing any other new make contracts. Well, there, there's a, do you see those questions there, John? Yeah, let me uh, well, I see them so pop up. Let me get here. Oh, yeah. look. So there's, there, there's one question from, from Samuel Boyu. Um, uh, when you age the whiskey made under contract, is it under your supervision in your warehouse or, or uh, are they kept at the seller's warehouse until they're ready to be bottled? Uh, under the new make contract, it's mostly uh, stored in, in their warehouse. We bring a little bit of it here, uh, but for the most part, they store it at their warehouse under a, a uh, under a, a you know under storage agreement. M most of, and we're limited in space and funds to build more rickhouses. So yeah, most of most of it stays there. Uh, and also, there's a, somebody asked if there's a standard American column plus a doubler. Yes, we use yep. a doubler. We don't use a thumper. We use a, a doubler. So we get about 125 proof off the still, off the beer column, or off the beer still. Uh, and then we, we double it up uh, under, again, just a simple double distillation and we get to about 140 proof. It runs very, very, con very, very consistent. Uh, you can go in there today is 140.3 and the Mars of 140.7. Pretty impressive. And just a, a follow up when, it, when it's at the seller's warehouse, when you say it's a, a warehouse agreement, are you choosing the condition, the warehouse conditions as well? Is that like an a la carte menu? No, but one one of the things that we did do, or we have done quite a bit, is to, uh, we yeah we don't get to tell them where to store it, but we do tell them what kind of barrels we want it in, um, at least for a large percentage of our barrels. And some of the barrels that we the barrel that we buy a typical barrel is a three to six month yard age barrel, uh, and then we use a, a product uh, from Independent Stave called Cooper a Cooper Select, which is a twelve to eighteen month yard age barrel. And so we believe that makes a difference. And the, the, a lot of the whiskey that we buy goes into those, um, those Cooper Select barrels, those extended 
yard age staves that help, you know, to help build the barrel up. And I, we think that matters to the maturity of the whiskey. Sorry, the, the appearance of maturity of the whiskey. <laughs> cool, any more questions before we move on? All righty. All right. Um, I just put this in, in there. I always like to, to bring this out when we talk about sourcing, uh, you know, th this family tree. By the way, I think this first appeared in, in GQ. And of course, as you can tell, John and I are GQ devotees. So, um, but it, no, I just think, you know, a lot of times, whether it's specific to us or other people who source, you know, uh, I think it's important to see that the only difference between, and I love Jim Beam, I'm not picking on Jim Beam, but, you know, Basil Hayden's is, is chosen from the old granddad stock, right? So except for the fact that they make both of them, it's basically they're, they're sourcing from themselves, right? It's, it's, it's basically the, you know, different iterations of the exact same whiskey. People have been doing it for a long, long time. The Heritage Distilleries in Kentucky have been doing it for a long time. And as things emerge where you've got people that have, I mean, as we all know, I mean, forget about guys like us. There, there's some really big guys who are sourcing from MGP for their rye, especially, right? Hey, Johnny, it's, can you zoom in on this slide? Somebody says they can't see it. Yeah, um, it's a bit tough to see. Yes. And, and perhaps we can make this resource available to people as well. This is such a fascinating slide. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me... Let me try. That's not any better, is it? Um, sorry. If you if you just Google American Whiskey Family Tree, this will come up. I'm not uh, I'm not smart enough to know how to. I mean, I guess I can blow it up this way. Let me see. Oh, that's if, better. Uh, yeah, it's still better. The when you take it off presenter view. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and we're on here. So, you know, there's the LG, uh, uh, LDI MGP tree. You know, I just think it's good. It's a good reference to, you know, it's not it's, it, sourcing whiskey or, or using one basic source of whiskey for a couple of different iterations is not new. What's new is being honest about it and being transparent about it. Can we talk about transparency for a second? Because you're completely correct. Uh, there is, n to me at least, there is nothing more important with any brand than transparency. You do whatever you want, just don't hide it from people. Is what is my kind of philosophy. So, what right. are what do you find the kind of the, the 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 pitfalls in transparency of something like this, and and how do you avoid them? I, I think well, we've, we've we've made a we made a commitment from the get go. Uh, as it turns out, when we first started sourcing whiskey, we were in a portfolio called Craft and Estate, which is not, doesn't really exist anymore. And it was all about grain to glass. So the first time we ever brought this, we had this, uh, we, we found this whiskey. Uh, we took it to our distributor and said, we have some really good whiskey. We didn't make it. We think we can bring it to the market affordably. If we do that and tell everybody the truth, do you think you can sell it? And he said, yeah, I think, I think you can. And for a while, we, we, that was, that was a new idea, right? That bringing that, again, bringing that Scotch whiskey style and telling everybody the truth that you didn't make it was a new thing until it turns out we were selling with a lot of people who were in the wine business. That was our, most of our distributors at the time were, were smaller uh, and, and, and super, super knowledgeable. And so they compared it to Negociant wine. And for a lot of people that gave them a nice connection to make and say, hey, I get it, right? I understand now, uh, which was really great. Obviously gave us a, a, a key thing, a key selling point. We were always open and honest about, try, tried to be open and honest about everything that we could, where it came from, you know, how, how we bring it to market. We don't take the labels off when it comes to the, you know, the, 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 the labels that say it's made at MGP or LDI or Seagram's. We don't take the labels when they come, when they come here. We, we try to be transparent. Somebody comes in the building, they can see where all this stuff comes from. We, we tell people basically everything that goes on at our distillery. When people come into the distillery, we hide, we don't tell them, how we filter and we don't let them see our recipes for our mash sheets. Other than that, 
everything at the distillery is available. Everything's at the distillery is open and, and open and, and there for everybody to see. And that's the same way that we run our business. So for us, right, as, as John likes to say, there's, there's a mayonnaise here that we, that we all love in the South. Um, and it's called Duke's mayonnaise. I don't think there's a little lady, old Mrs. Dukes is whipping that stuff up in the corner, right? It's made at a big factory that makes mayonnaise. But they didn't tell me that either. They didn't tell me that Miss Dukes is whipping that stuff up. So don't, don't feed me a bullshit story and tell me that you made this or that your great granddaddy made this or that some gangster made this recipe if it came from MGP. Is the whiskey good? Are you honest with me? That's what I want to know. And I, and I want that with any product that I buy. Just tell me the truth. Right? Let the product speak for itself. And that's kind of where we started with, with transparency. So we're, we're, we try to do that about everything that we do in our business, whether it's about whiskey or it's about other parts of our business. Even when, even when you don't want to hear it, we, we try to be there and try to, try to be open and honest about everything that we do. By the, way, at the end of, by the way, at the end of this, we're giving away some gift packages and we'll make sure that there's a little thing of Duke's mayonnaise in each one of those. So you guys can <laughs> see, see for yourself the great glory that is Duke's mayo. Uh, and that's just a little thank you for tuning in. <laughs> exactly. Dukes is the only mayo. And Lucas asks, is there a reason why you don't share how you filter? Uh-huh. Yes. We, we think that we have a really good process that um, takes out enough of the bits of the barrel without removing too much flavor. We don't chill filter anything that we do. We bottle everything above 92 proof, so about 46% ABV. Most of it's more than that. It's uh, 46 and a, uh, sorry, 49 and a half percent um, or more. And we think there's something special about the way that we filter. So we just don't tell anybody or show anybody what we do. We have a two part system and uh, it's just something we don't, we don't share. Does it make a difference? I don't know. Does our RO water make a difference? I don't know, but lots of people tell us that they have product from us that is made at MGP and product from other people that is made at MGP and ours tastes better. We believe that to be true. Not 100% sure why that is. We do believe the filtration and the water make a difference. But uh, to be honest with you, you know, we're, that would be, we don't know all the time. So, sorry. And there is a fine line, right, between being transparent and maintaining proprietary information um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, things like your, your recipes and, and, and things like that, I think, are just fine. It, it, it certainly gets a little bit, uh, I know that there, there, there can be some distilleries, for example, that will make one product and, uh, and, and it's additives that turns that one product into 50 brands. Uh, and uh, we were, uh, I won't mention any names, but I remember it was only a few years ago when there was a really, really big uh, whiskey that had uh, on the outside uh, apparent uh, long and illustrious history to this brand. Uh, but again, it is an MGP product uh, and, uh, and everyone cottoned onto it. And I think that everyone felt a little bit lied to. So um, I think that preparity information is absolutely fine uh, as, long as, as long as the transparency is there. And I, I do certainly applaud you for, for champion the transparency for sure. Well, you know, we, we thank you for that. One of the things that we've done is we've, we've said that we won't call anybody out. We, I don't think it's right to, to name other brands. We really just call out the practice, right? So we, we're not, we don't really point things. We have a really funny video on our YouTube page about fake whiskey stories, um, which is uh, John and I being really silly. Uh, but our intent was to not call out anybody specifically in any way. It was to really just call out the fact that sometimes the industry is less than honest about what they source. And so for us, it was, it was paramount for us to bring that to the forefront and to make a little fun of, of it along the way. Mm -hmm. And we did, uh, we were speaking just before this um, uh, in re uh, relation to filtration, uh, we were talking about, uh, and we'll come on to this again a bit later on, but we do have uh, a, a fun announcement uh, with both Smooth Ambler and the CPBA and the BBF. Um, and we're coming out with a private label, which probably won't be available here in Ontario because of um, ethyl carbonate uh, issues. Um, do you think that uh, ethyl carbonate uh, and certain filtration um, um, styles might leave that number to be slightly higher? Repeat the question again. Do you think that um, ethyl carbonate and uh, and certain filtrations would uh, certain filtration methods uh, would leave a little bit of the ethyl carbonate in as opposed to removing a little bit more of it? Uh, I think it's uh, I think ethyl carbonate is a distillation uh, a distillation issue, right? With with uh, 
exposure to copper and some other things. And so I think uh, if you're bottling really high proof whiskey, you have to be, you have to be careful about EC, right? And well, also if you're not using enough copper in the distillation path. So, um, you know, some of the whiskey that we, obviously the whiskey that we have, we run on a 100% column still. So the still and the doubler are both copper. And, um, but you know, we, we can't always control the whiskey that we source. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, should we move back onto the presentation? Uh, sure. But just to just to talk real quickly about a couple of the specific whiskeys. Um, you know the the Old Scout American whiskey, which is uh, I know one that is available up in Canada. We sold it here for several years. We actually don't produce it for the U.S. market. Um, anymore, and the reason for that is the, is the next slide. We have Old Scout Bourbon again, but this was something we were really, um, was a unique project for us, having really done only uh, bourbon and rye for a while in, in the sourcing. We, we had an opportunity uh, as a spot purchase to, to buy some bourbon that had been aged in a rejuvenated barrel. So they'd used it once for, for whiskey, emptied it out, uh, scraped the, the inside of the barrel, recharted, it, retoasted it, and then used it again. And the, the whiskey is a bourbon in every other way except for that barrel treatment. And so we saw an opportunity to take that product, to blend it with a little bit of the bourbon that we had from MGP and release uh, an American whiskey. You know, I, I feel like it, it is it is because of that lack of transparency that the that the quote unquote American whiskey market is the redheaded stepchild that it is. It certainly would never, regardless of transparency, it never would have unseated bourbon or or rye. But I think it has such a bad reputation as like mystery whiskey because there's so many out there that they don't tell you what it is and they don't tell you what the mash bills are. Sometimes you don't know who made it. Sometimes you don't know what the age is. It's just sort of it's something out there that's bottled that, uh, for the most part, is pretty unclear about it in general. And so we, we, need, we needed to have this whiskey because we had run out of bourbon, as John was talking about. But we also felt like it was really an opportunity to, to stretch that commitment to transparency and put something on the market that was an antidote to a lot of the real bullshit whiskey that we saw, but bullshit in a different way. Not, not full of shit because it was, you know, somebody's famous uh, recipe, but because we did everything we could to tell you exactly uh, what the whiskey was, where it was from. We tried to, we tried to inject transparency into uh, a category that is rife with, like I said, mi just mystery whiskey, you know, uh, and well, I feel like we did this. Of course, the the day that we made the decision to pull it from the U.S. market is the height at its reputation down here. And now we're actually getting emails from people being like, "What the hell? You mean you're not making Old Scout American whiskey anymore? We love that stuff." And of course, John and I, John and I are like, the first response is, "Great, we love that you love it." Second response is, well, "You should have bought twenty thousand cases of it three years ago. We'd still be selling." Um, <laughs> But but anyway, I wanted I wanted to bring that up. You want to stop there and see if anybody has any questions about this or any other American whiskey that we've talked about, or you want me to keep going? John uh, Jared brings up a uh, Jared Craven asked a great question on chat. Great question. Uh, really really wonderful question. Basically about people automatically dismissing source spirits and then really not knowing about the skills involved in sourcing and blending and post distillation. And yeah. his question is, what are your thoughts about consumer perception and how best to combat negative perceptions? of that for the general public who might not have as much exposure to brands and spirits education. And I think that is an absolutely wonderful question. You want to handle that? Yeah. Can you read it back? So I have a minute to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you say to people here? Let me, let me, let me, let me get it to you. It's funny, right? He's the English major, but I have been reading the question. Um, how do you combat the negative perception that the general public might have about sourced whiskey, right? They're not all people with, uh, you know, a lot of background, a lot of spirits, uh, wine and spirits education, and don't really understand how much goes on. So how do you, what's, the, how do you overcome that hurdle? You know, I think the, the metaphor that I've always used, and we, we've used a couple of restaurant metaphors already, 
is really that that procurement idea of someone in the in the kitchen and they either they go out and they get the best ingredients that they can and they either put their spin on uh, those ingredients and produce something that eventually winds up on your plate in the dining room or they are trusted by you to put out something really really good that maybe they didn't make now I selfishly I come from a food uh, background I worked for Cisco Foods for a long long time and uh, I had restaurants that made absolutely everything from scratch and I had some upscale restaurants who would source from Cisco or from some other, somebody else um, you know a dessert or a, a, an appetizer or something like that you know I, it's one of the best restaurants where John and I uh, lived for years never made a cheesecake and his he made a couple of other desserts, but there was one cheesecake in particular he really loved and thought was great. He saw it at a food show. And whenever anybody would ask him about it, he would say, listen, here's the thing. I can make a cheesecake better than this some of the time, but I can't make a cheesecake this good every time. And so I choose to buy this one and put it on the menu, and I hope you like it. And so I don't know, maybe there's some something in there for conveying to to the layman that like, you know, it it really is about being honest. And by the way, he was honest that he didn't make that cheesecake with his with his customers, you know, and they trusted him to know what he was doing. And, you know, you'd be surprised. I would be be in there having dinner and somebody would ask where the cheesecake comes from, he would tell them, and it, they would they would all they would all order it. Nobody ever turned their nose up at it because he didn't make it because they trusted him to know what he was doing to, to get something great out, uh, whether he produced it or not. And I think there's a lesson there for people who source whiskey and people who, you know, are straight with you about it down here. We say, you know, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. Right. And so we, the, the idea is to, you, you just do it right. Just tell the story straight and and do it right mm -hmm. there is i went to a brandy distillery one time and i saw wine barrels of wine being brought into it and i thought to myself uh, especially with things kind of like wine you you'll see the uh or, or any kind of brandy distillery just to keep it on, on on distilled products you have the 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 thought in your head that maybe there are vineyards surrounding it or apple orchards surrounding it uh, but all of that comes from the open market as well. And if you are working with barrels, usually you get them uh, from, uh, uh, you don't have your own cooperage, you get them from the open market too. So um, every kind of element, depending on what your business model is, can be, can be sourced in a, in a way here. We do have a good question as well uh, from, uh, from Nick Box uh, that uh, kind of compares uh, this model to Appleton, uh, whereas Joy would uh, blend the rums. She doesn't distill them. Does she not distill the rums herself at Appleton's? Um, maybe someone else can speak to that. Um, but there are a lot of examples of that. Well, let me, let, let me stick on the food one, because this is one that John and I experienced. You know, we didn't get this fat, not, not turning down food. We are in New York City last year at one of our favorite bagel places, and you go in, and, the, you know, they've got, the, they got the, the, the bagels coming off, and they've got them 15 different ways, and you're standing there in front of this counter, and they have like 40 different kind of schmears, right? They've got, they've got dill, they've got olive, they've got salmon, they've got, you know, garlic, cream cheese, and just this plethora of all these choices. John and I have been in this place together or separately probably 15 times. When we go in, and I got high blood pressure, which means I love any concentration of salt. So I get the salt bagel with the olive schmear on it. So that at the end of me eating the bagel, I can feel the veins popping out of my neck. So we're looking at all these things, and we get our order, and we leave, and we walk out. And what do we see being delivered? Pallet after pallet of these ready-to-go schmears in these two-gallon buckets from a place over in Jersey. All they do all day long is make these things. And for years, we thought that they were making them in the back, you know, just getting cases of cream cheese and letting them, letting them slack out a little bit to where they could whip them and put their own ingredients in because that's the presentation that you got. But, but yet we're walking out and we see this. And we weren't mad about it. Still great, still great place. 
it, it was just funny that, you know, we had, like you're talking about with the, the barrels of wine coming in, or you think it's being, being uh, sourced locally or whatever. We just had it in our heads, of course. They made this stuff from scratch every day. They didn't really say that they did. That was kind of our perception and our uh, preconceived notion of it. Righto. So if anyone's got any other questions on, uh, 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 on that topic, uh, jump in now. Otherwise, uh, maybe we'll move on. All right, then. So, so real, real quickly, let's just touch on Old Scout bourbon. Um, you know, this is the 100% made in Indiana. It's a, it's a high rye mash bill, 60% uh, corn, 36 rye, four malted barley. This is what, what John was talking about, about the, the barrels that are shipped directly to them. And, and, you know, so this is four to five years old. Again, the difference between this and a spot purchase is what we're drinking today was distilled four or five years ago. Everyone involved knowing that it, those barrels would eventually come to West Virginia for us. These were, these, these were under contract as opposed to the, the spot purchase. Um, and this is the whiskey from which the custom program uh, is chosen. So it's this mash bill, all of these things, except for the proof, because when you choose a custom, and I've got a, I've got a slide uh, about that in a minute, but it's, uh, it's a true cask strength. So it'll be, what are we seeing, John? 115 to 119 usually? Yeah, that's about right. It seems like that's, that's what I'm seeing. Um, we do have another product headed your way up there called Contradiction. Um, contradiction is a, is a marriage uh, bourbon and not a merchant bottle because it is a partially homemade by us and then roughly two-thirds not. So there's, there's one component of it is whiskey that we make from scratch here in West Virginia, a weeded bourbon, and the other two bourbons in it are ones from Tennessee and ones from, from Indiana. Let me, let me speak to this product just a little bit. This, is, this, this product was... was um, really an experiment for us we, we i had a I drank a product a while back from heaven hill from the uh parker's parker heritage it was a um, master distillers blend of mash bills and it is one of the best bourbons i've ever had ever and it is a blend of i believe it's a blend of weeded bourbon and bourbon made with rye and i believe they're 13 to 17 years old uh, and so we, we weren't going to make that because we didn't have 13 to 17 year old whiskey, but we had some, some nine year old bourbon from, from MGP. And we had some at the time, two year old bourbon from West Virginia, a weeded bourbon from West Virginia. And we blended those together in a couple of different formulations, spent a couple of months doing that, playing around with it, what we liked, what we didn't like. And then once we, we narrowed it down to maybe three different, um, three different blends and, and, and blend is such a dirty word right in the business because it really kind of, it, it really, most people think of it as a dilution with neutral grain spirit in some way, but this is, this is all bourbon. So marriage or mingling is, is really a better term. And so we, we took those three marriages and we sent those off to some friends of ours who, whose um, palate we respect. And then we sent some to, a wonderful woman named Nancy Fraley. If, if anybody knows her, they call her Nancy the Nose, and she is a sensory analysis expert in California. So we sent her some samples. Turns out we all like the same sample. Uh, everybody at the distillery, everybody that we sent it to, all like the same sample. And then we tweak that a little bit to kind of pull out some different flavors. So what we do now is we take three straight bourbon whiskeys. So a straight bourbon from Tennessee, a straight bourbon from Indiana, and a straight bourbon from West Virginia. We dump uh, all of that into individual tanks and then we marry that into a blending tank based off of the percentage. Uh, again, it's a third of it is, is house-made juice and the other two thirds are sourced, uh, or sourced whiskey, right? Indiana and Tennessee. We, we put it at the tank and then we fill it, we put it back into the same barrels that it came out of. So like a reconsolidation, not, there's no finishing on it, right? It's going in the same barrels it came out of. 
we hold it for about 90 days in that um, in those barrels and then we dump it again and the way we dump typically is that we dump a couple different batches so we so we marry it uh, and then we pull say a batch from this Tuesday or a batch from next Tuesday so if we're going to dump five barrels or six barrels we dump two from here and two from here and two from there and so it's a mingling of a mingling and that gives us a lot of consistency in the product uh, and this product when it first came out again was a blend of two to nine years old now it's a blend of four to 12 year old bourbon and you know it, it's gotten we've gotten better at blending the whiskey's gotten older over the years and so this whiskey has really become we can see that too even in so like in social media feedback from customers and other ways we really see that this whiskey is really starting to come into its own we love it but it is uh, all straight bourbon there is a law in the u.s that says if you blend bourbon from two or more states that it has to be called a blend of straight bourbon whiskeys so there is actually no blend I mean, there's no mingling again of uh of, of anything other than 100% straight bourbon, but by law, it has to be called a blend of straight bourbon whiskeys because it comes, it comes from these three states. So that, that clarifies it, but some people still don't know if it's straight bourbon. It absolutely is. There's nothing in here except straight bourbon. And, and this product is, we, I drink more of Contradiction than anything else we make. And let me ask the, just a couple of questions. I know we were talking about pot stills and column stills earlier on. Now we're looking at this blend here and we've got homemade and sourced whiskey in here. Are there any similarities between this product and say um, uh, a blended Scotch or Irish whiskey uh, that would be made with uh, a column and pot still uh, whiskeys combined? It's certainly what we, you know, what we used to, well, let's see here, almost all of the whiskey cup going into contradiction now is a, is column still the stuff that we make the one third of the one third percentage that we add all of almost all of that is column still a little bit of pot still hanging on from there uh we'll transition into all column still because we stopped making pot still whiskey right four or five years ago um i, I think any whiskey that is a marriage of multiple whiskeys is has some similarities right we're, we're all trying to figure out how to find what is it about each individual product that we like so much and how it can make the sum greater than the individual parts. And, and so one of the things that we love about contradiction, and I don't know any other way to describe it. I mean, I say mouthfeel, but when I get done drinking contradiction, I constantly want to lick my lips and that creaminess, that oiliness that's in the product is really what drove us to this specific blend. So we're trying to get that, you know, that those big, some of those big bold flavors from the Indiana whiskey. We're trying to get some of that maturity from the, from the Tennessee whiskey, from the Tennessee bourbon. And then from us, we're trying to get mouthfeel and some, and some nice sweetness and some nice butterscotch and some caramel from that. And so we're always trying to find that in, in each one of those individual products and hopefully make the product better than it would be on its own. So I think yeah. everybody's doing that. Is it, how, how else does it compare? I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure, right? Because so much of this stuff now is column still, and I don't think we have like a uh, a pot still whiskey that is right. That is right. Is really super heavy, and it's balancing out this really clean column still whiskey. In terms of the the the, the robustness of the whiskey, it's more about the what's the the grain of, in the whiskey as opposed to a, a distillation method, at least in our blend. Okay, and then you mentioned uh, Nancy the nose. Was it? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. really? Sounds like a gangster. <laughs> so you mentioned Nancy the Nose, and obviously uh, you you both have uh, a passion and a knowledge and understanding uh, of blending whiskey as well. Um, is there something? Is 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 there any uh, market for um, outsourcing blending as well as the production of whiskey? Not, not that we know of, right? We're, we we haven't seen people do that. Um, yeah, we haven't seen anybody do that. The, the only person that we know that's blending American whiskey like this, at least in, on our size, is, is us. So, um, yeah, don't, don't really know. I saw John's question here. Yep. And then I have one last question here as well that I just want to address. Um, and this regards New Oak. Uh, so this is a blend of three bourbons, so it will all be New Oak. Uh, but sometimes you reuse your oak as well? We, we don't reuse oak. Um, so that goes straight to the brokers? It, it's, yeah, it used to, we used to sell most of it to uh, brewers or to friends, you know, right, customers at the tasting room or 
Robert, give those away to somebody that needed it for a wedding decoration, right? Whatever, whatever was, it was kind of a mix and mingle of all those things. Now with our relationship with, with Perno, most of our barrels uh, go to go overseas. They get consolidated in Kentucky and then they go overseas for Jameson and some other products. Jameson and the Glen Livet, more than likely. Some will probably go to Mexico, maybe the Caribbean as well. Maybe Cuba gets some. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where they. Yeah. I'm not sure where they go. I know that they. Uh, it's good for us to have one place for them to go, right? It's a. It's a. Oh yeah. It's a waste problem in, in essence, right? Once you're done with the barrel, it's just taking up. We don't have a lot of space where we are, so it's just taking up space. That's right. Awful lot of logistics and yeah. getting getting them moved on. Johnny, you want to keep going? Yeah, list. so just the, the really the, the last thing that we had product wise is just to talk a little bit about the custom pick. You know, this is the this is the label. This differs from the 99 proof again because of cast strength. Uh, the the actual proof is written in, the age is written in. And in this field, you, you see it says hand selected by. This is one that we do back here in West Virginia and sell at the gift shop. It's just the silhouette of of our state, but you can have a logo uh, put in there of, you know, the, if it's a retailer, they would do maybe the name of the retailer, a bourbon club, do a bourbon club, a bartender's guild. And that's actually an old fashioned hand stamp. That's not a, um, you know, a, a printer that's supposed to look like a stamp. We, we actually have one made and, and uh, the bottling crew sit there with the an ink pad and the stamp and, and put it in there for you to, to make it more specialized. And this has been a super popular uh, back in the, in the old days. Uh, and now that we have, uh, we've got the inventory to sort of re re release or um, reinvigorate, restart this program. Now uh, it's taken off like a shot. I mean, we, we've, I mean, we've got people lined up to, to get in on it. The retailers and bourbon clubs that have gotten possession of the, the barrels that they pick, you know, people are already collecting them and fighting over them and trading them. And we just couldn't be, we just couldn't be happier. But, you know, again, cast strength, no chill filtration. Uh, it really just goes through a particulate filter to, to pull out the flex of charcoal and the things you would have. I mean, this, this is as close as you can get to just walking up to the barrel with a drill and drilling a hole in it and, and uh, pouring some out into a glass. And this is the one, this is the, um, uh, for, for anyone watching and listening, uh, we have a couple of barrels of this coming up with uh, special labels uh, for us here in Canada. Um, we're gonna have a um, CPBA label uh, of this brand, and we're gonna have a bartender benevolent fund label of this brand as well. Uh, so that should be coming up, um, Mr. Smolensky, do you have an idea of when that should be coming up? Yeah, we, we there, there's a we, we actually have to wait. Uh, we, we might have to make a stop first in in Alberta, and we have to wait for a couple of private retailers. Um, if they take too long, we'll just bring it in anyway. Just to talk about the the, the program and why why we did this, we're just um, you know we we, I, we don't have a lot of resources as a small Canadian company, and and, and I, Smooth Ambler is is still you know you know, operating as an independent, how can we help make, um, make a difference? Um, so, um, uh, I think it's either going to be $5 or $10 from every single bottle that is sold, um, with the, with the bartenders benevolence fund, um, uh, custom pick or the CPBA custom pick is going to go directly back to those two charities. Uh, so, um, so it, it was just, I, I think a, a way of, of contributing back, um, Spirited Sessions really now has become a, a, a virtual fundraiser uh, for out-of-work bartenders, and and um, you know we we appreciate so much um, everyone's zeal for for education and learning more and and uh, ex extending their their knowledge, and I think this is a, a, a creative way of of, of giving back. Um, so yeah, we're we're very proud to do it, and I think this is the, the first time that we're sharing this. Um, so, uh, we, we just have a, a couple of people that we have to wait on, but, 
uh, it will be it will be available. Just to 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 go back and talk about the, the, the why we can't send it to Ontario is because the ethyl carbamate levels are are too high. So what's going to end up happening is 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 the 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 bartender benevolent fund old scalp bourbon and the and the Canadian Professional Bartenders Association uh, old scalp bourbon are most likely going to land in Alberta, and then you'll and then we'll just ship, move them around from province to province from there. Um, so ho hopefully that helps and there'll, there'll be some more information that, that, that comes out about it. But yeah, this is a, a great opportunity to, to, to share that information and um, uh, it wouldn't happen without John uh, Gray and, and, and the BBF and, and Trevor Callies and Amber Bruce and the CPBA and uh, definitely not without all, all of your support of, of everything that Sovereign does and, and Old Scout and, and our family of brands. So so John, I, John Smolinski, I think something really cool about this is that um, so we, that we've used these to do donations in the past um, twice now, and we're and we're we're saving up for that. We save. We can only ship full cases. So if you bottle 26 cases out of a barrel and you have two bottles left over, we take those remnants and we hold on to them in our in our bonded facility, and then uh, remove them from the bonded facility. We've done it again. We've done it twice. So we've held on to those remnants. Uh, I think the last time we did. I don't know, about 90 barrels, or sorry, about 90 individual bottles that had been over about a four year span, three or four year span. And we've auctioned those off. Uh, we did that in Kentucky, I guess three years ago, two, two and a half years ago, uh, when, there, when there was a flood in, in Houston and a flood in, um, in Florida. And we donated $27,000 to the flood relief from the sale of those bottles. Because uh, we had we had gone through a flood ourselves in West Virginia, and uh, at the, that during that time we also did a donation and raised uh, I think twenty six thousand dollars at that time and donated that to flood relief. So it's always great to see these to see these barrels doing doing some good like that. I think it's uh, I think it's really really wonderful. We we're certainly proud of the uniqueness that these barrels offer, and uh, and certainly as Johnny said, it's like drinking whiskey from the barrel. So it's really great to see. <laughs> And so just to talk, uh, just to address a question on um, kind of logistics, when it does come up, we're looking at a few weeks away still with this. Um, but when it comes up, we will probably, Samuel, just to address your question, it will probably arrive in the West. Um, more information will be released uh, in the coming weeks with this, um, but it will probably land in the West. Uh, and then we can, um, we can um, privately um, uh, uh, get this delivered to us. So uh, we can get um, here in Ontario products from Alberta and from BC mailed to us now. Uh, worst case scenario, that will be, that will be it. John, do you have any uh, uh, plans to launch this in Quebec? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, the, the the only uh, uh, the only roadblock with the with the whole ethyl carbamate thing is just in Ontario. Uh, j just so just so everyone knows, and I don't want to take away from the presentation. In Quebec, our uh, we have a sister agency. They're they're called Molly Pitcher. Um, so uh, two wonderful ladies, uh, Val Chagnon and and, and Steph Darwish. Um, and so um, uh, they will be easily be able to private order. Um, fr from our from our Western uh, uh, warehouses, we're just going to land it in the West. Um, it will be easily accessible in all other nine provinces. It's only in Ontario because of this ethyl carbamate thing that we'll have to send the bottles in through uh, uh, the mail, uh, essentially. Uh, but the other nine provinces it will be very simple to to do bond to bond to bond uh, uh, board transfers. So, but yeah, just just so people know, in in, in Quebec, Sovereign is is Molly Pitcher. Um, so if you go to if you email Molly Pitcher at SovereignCanada.com or Samuel, I can hit you up offline with the, with the information for Val and stuff, or, or anyone in Quebec. Johnny, what else you got there? Yeah, that that's pretty much that's pretty much it. I mean, that just this is I slid in a picture of of you know the bottling. This is a. Uh, this is one of our elaborate robots that we use in the bottling uh, room that look like a human being. Now that's a guy named Stu, um, who works for us. Uh, Stu's a bass player, so we get to play a little music together every now and then. But anyway, I just put that I just put that in, and that's that's essentially the end of it the, of the presentation. It's just uh, I guess we can we can we've had questions along the way, but we can fully move on to to Q and A now if you want.
Also, I, th I think we have uh, some some stuff to give away. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Let's, let's address let's address a question real quick from from Ruben regarding sourcing. Uh, do you guys have any problems with consistency when barrels are in different places uh, and in different warehouses? E.g., this year's barrels are all in a humid section. Next year's barrels happen to be in a drier section. No, we we certainly notice it in single barrels. It's one of the things that um, I guess has created some uniqueness for, for the single barrel programs uh, or these custom programs that we, that we do, right? People love to find out all the unique, uh, what's unique about each individual barrel. How can two barrels right beside each other be so, so different? And, um, and so that certainly for us, that's really awesome, right? One is one, one might be low, it might've been in a really humid environment, it might be low proof, and one might've been in a really dry environment, it might be really high proof. And so how do, how do those, how is that whiskey different over its lifetime of that maturation uh, as, the, as the whiskey in the barrel and, and its uh, chemical reaction with the wood different because the proof is different or because the environment is different. And that has really been awesome for single barrels. In blending, we're, we're trying to find barrels that, um, we, we also said that we never, at least with Old Scout, we never wanted to be, consistent we wanted to be consistently great so from batch to batch if there's a little bit of variation it's never really bothered us too much but i think by the time you blend five barrels together i think you lose that uniqueness that you might have in a single barrel and that that consistency is not uh or that that individuality is not really noticed so much so at least for us we haven't noticed that to be a, a very big problem but you certainly see some crazy barrels we have we had a lot of barrels years ago that were uh, at cash strength, we're in the 90 proof, so, right? So 45 to, to 50% at cash strength, which was, which is crazy. We bottled up, we just did a, we're really, really brilliant marketers, as you might be able to tell. We had a product that was older than the regular old scout. So we called it very old scout. <laughs> and uh, because we're, because we're so, so smart like that. Uh, and we just bottled one of those, a 14 year old uh, barrel, it was eight at cash strength. It was 86.4 proof. So 43.2 ABV. And I think it's the single best thing we've ever put into a bottle in our 10 years. It is absolutely the most drinkable, delicious whiskey ever, but right. It's a 43.2% whiskey at cash strength. So certainly it was in a very humid environment uh, in the warehouse at MGP for a long time. We've had it here for about five years, but for a long time, it was in a very humid environment. I was shocked to see how low the proof went. Uh, I, you know, barrel at 100, barrel at 60 ABV and get it all the way down to 43.2. It's traveled a long way. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Because consistency has to be, when you have so many moving parts, consistency has to be monitored uh, at every stage. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Smolensky, do you want to talk about the giveaway? Yeah. So um, uh, the Johns have uh, put together a little uh, uh, gift pack um, that they're going to send directly. Um, last last spirited sessions, um, we did a little uh, keyboard trivia um, for a, for a giveaway, um, and um, there, so there's going to be three prizes. I actually don't know what's in the prize pack. Maybe jo maybe John Foster and John Little can uh, can share. Um, we, will, we will send a, a uh, gift package of a variety of things from the gift shop, from swag to food items. Trust me, it, it will be, it will, you will be very happy when you receive it, I promise. <laughs> so, get your, so get your fingertips uh, ready. Yeah, Duke's mayo is, is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> mayo. <laughs> Everybody wants to think of mayo. That's right. if, you don't have, if you haven't had Duke's mayo, you've never eaten mayo. <laughs> <laughs> Message board just erupted with mayo today. Even though we're simulcasting onto Facebook, unfortunately, that's uh, those people on Facebook can't can't get it. So um, get your fingers ready, and then um, uh, how are we going to do this three trivia question? Yeah, uh, yeah. Were you paying attention? Let's. Uh, um, uh, John, do you want to ask the? Or, one of the Johns you want to ask the question? I've got one. To, who, who remembers uh, who we first, the people who owned the barrels we first sourced? Anybody remember that one? Oh, and that Foster. was fast. Keith, 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 Keith got that one. 
I think wow. I, I think I gotta be honest with you. I think that was already typed in there, and somebody just hit enter. I think that was. I think that was too. I think that, that was, was too quick. Easy. You hadn't finished your sentence, and the right answer was up there. That was that was nice. great. Nice. Someone's done all the right types. Like... <laughs> Donnie, you got one? Yeah. Uh, if for those of you, boy, you uh, had to be paying close attention. How long have John and I been friends? <laughs> oh, dang. oh, wow. That nice. was pretty good. Cedric Foley got that too. Oh, Cedric Davis. Foley. All right. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So, yeah. so who are who are our winners? Who, so right now we have we have Keith Nicholson and and um, uh, one of our, our W set proctors actually. There's a couple of W set people on the line. So thank you thank you for coming. So Keith uh, uh, and and W set by the way W set is in is in Canada um, and uh, there, there's going to be more programming from W set pretty soon. W set is an awesome 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 uh, uh, learning tool. Uh, I don't think I'd be where I am without it. Um, so that's one, right. and and then and then the second one was uh, Cedric Foley, who's in who's in Calgary. Um, you can oh, Cedric, congratulations. Yeah, and then are we are we giving away the third one? Yeah, yeah. yeah they were, they were you have a question, or you want me to come up with one? Uh, I don't have a question because I've been toggling different screens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> John, you're locked and loaded and ready to go. <laughs> John Little, you got one. No, man, go ahead. Right. You're a sales guy. You're supposed to know this stuff. I, I just didn't want to get in. I didn't, <laughs> look, I didn't want to deny, somebody, I didn't want to deny the opportunity. But look, somebody already said 51%. Micah's just throwing out. <laughs> you got to love that. Micah's just throwing out dogs. 51%. 51%. Corn. Barrel. Uh, <laughs> nice. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, all right. Um, how, about the three, how about the three states? in the contradiction blend yeah there you go ready in question the, the, the bourbon contradiction comes to three different oh. states oh luke, i think lucas got it yeah luke, lucas timons uh oh that's how you win it as well you short type the answer that's brilliant yeah vancouver <laughs> uh calgary and uh toronto all uh all coming in with prizes it's Pretty awesome to see uh, spirited sessions uh, happen from coast to coast. There's some people from Newfoundland uh, uh, and uh, people from Victoria and everywhere in between. And I think we have some American friends uh, as well. So uh, we will continue to do this every, every two weeks. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, John Gray, for being such a, a brilliant host. Um, I was teasing him before that he should have his own uh, late night show. Um, I, I'd watch it. Uh, you and me, yeah. yeah. Right, the late, late show with John Gray. So uh, late, no one's up. <laughs> yeah, Kelsey Grammer would be your first uh, host. <laughs> um, and uh, th thank you so much for John, uh, to John Foster and John Little for for sharing um, all their knowledge. And I can't believe how well these are are going. I, I've, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled. Thank you for your support. This doesn't exist if you don't continue to. To, uh, uh, to, to get our stuff and, and uh, engage with us. And uh, we are very, very accessible and, and we're, we're very much looking forward to, uh, to uh, you know, when this is all over to be able to have a, a whiskey with all of you. So um, lots, of, lots of love. Uh, if you have any more questions, um, uh, let us know. We're, we're very easy to find. And uh, I will, we, will, we will see you in two weeks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Wonderful, engaging crowd. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. See y'all. Right,